All right, so I'm going to turn it over to our president, um, Laura Seligman, and we're going to get started with the town hall. Please note that we are recording and everyone is unmuted upon entry, but we'll have opportunities for questions, comments, and interaction in a little bit. So Laura, take it away. Thank you, Rosara. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Laura Seligman. I am president of ABCT and a professor at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Um, I'd like to thank you for attending what I'm hoping will be the first of many ABC Town Halls. And I wanna start off with, I guess, a couple of thanks. First and foremost, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to attend. I know that um, everyone's time is at a premium right now. And I also know that Zoom meetings are getting a little old for everybody. But it's really important for the organization. ABCT is really um, our members. And so it's important for the organization for us to have your participation. So first and foremost, I wanna thank you for coming. Secondly, I wanna thank Mary Jane and Dakota and Stephen and everybody in the central office. It's one thing to say, I would like to have a town hall. It's definitely another thing to say, I wanna do it as soon as possible, which I think Mary Jane will tell you is usually my time frame, <laughs> And it's another thing to make it possible and to actually get it done. So I wanna thank all of you for doing that for us today. Um, I wanna talk about why the town halls were one of my first things I did as ABCT president. And really I wanna direct you to the, um, my first presidential column. Hopefully all of you have received the behavior therapist either in the mail or you know, gone online to our new website and taken a look at that. And in there, I explain how I see the town halls as a way to engage our members and really as a way to act on the board's desire to increase um, equity, access and inclusion in the organization. So in other words, this is a concrete step that we wanna to take towards that goal. So then the question is why the convention is our first, as the first town hall? First of all, I think, you know, I'm a member of ABCT. I've been a member for many years and I know the convention and what gets chosen to be presented at the convention and more specifically what doesn't get chosen is an area that members have a lot to say about. And I know it's something you wanna give us feedback on. Um, also though, the convention and getting it right and making sure that we're promoting the science that we want to there is central to many of the organization's goals. Getting it right helps us to support innovation and ethical delivery of CBT. And it also makes sure that we're at least taking that first step towards disseminating the best of what CBT has to offer. My third reason for making this our first town hall is actually equally important. And that is because um, one of the greatest pleasures I've had is present so far has been working with my convention team. I am very lucky to have a group that super smart women, energetic, and very relevant for today, a group that's able to receive feedback and has the skills to put that feedback into action. So the goals for us today are to have an open and transparent conversation about the criteria used to evaluate convention submissions, and to take a look at a proposal of how to translate those evaluations into actual decisions. We'd also like to demystify the process and get your feedback. And importantly, we wanna increase access to information that has the potential to impact the quality of your experience at the convention and to impact the convention content. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Rosara Arango Aguayo to start us off. Thank you so much, Flora. It's a pleasure to have everyone here. 
Um, I would love for our amazing panelists today to introduce themselves. So I'm going to be um, asking them to unmute. Give me just one second. And while I do that, um, a little bit about me. I am Rosara Arango Aguayo, and I am the ABCT 2022 Convention Program Chair. I'm an associate professor at the Medical University of South Carolina, where I focus on mental health disparities and access to care, primarily um, among Hispanic Latinx youth in the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, really, my goal for today is to provide um, open um, information, transparent conversations about what, what is the process of submitting for ABCT, what have been existing review criteria, and perhaps propose some changes to make the process more transparent and more um, uh, clear to our membership. So I'm going to let um, Christina introduce herself and her role at ABCT, and then we'll go with Emily. Hey everyone. So I am Tina Boiseau, and I am an associate professor at Northwestern Feinberg. Uh, most of my research and clinical work focuses on OCD. Uh, so at ABCT, I am the current workshops chair. However, I've also in the past served as institute's chair. And today I'll be representing our ticketed events and really discussing a little bit more about the submission and review process for them and how we decide what is what is being offered at the convention. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tina. Emily? Hi, my name is Emily Thomas. I am a clinical assistant professor at the University of Iowa. And uh, today my role will be associate program chair for the 2022 convention. Awesome. So we have an amazing team and let's get started. So our agenda for today is quite ambitious, but what we hope to accomplish first is provide information. What is the current um, submission process? What types of submissions can you um, incorporate at ABCT through two mechanisms, ticketed sessions and general sessions? Then we'll solicit member feedback. Really, this is where we wanna focus the majority of our efforts today. What has worked, what has not, and what are some suggestions for improvement? And here's what we propose to do today. We'll take this feedback and see what can we do for 2022 and what requires longer implementation steps that our team will meet with the 2023 convention team planning meeting um, team and um, pass this information along in the hopes that efforts will continue across um, administrations. Um, but before we start that, it's really important for us to come to some suggested agreements for this group. Um, we ask that um, when it's time for comments or questions to please use your raise hand icon, which can be located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and this will uh, kind of put you in a queue and we will unmute you. Or I will be monitoring the chat with questions and comments that I will bring to the team for discussion. The reason we do this is to minimize background noise. The other thing that we ask is that we be kind to each other. We are all trying our best. In fact, Emily and I are newbies to this. It's our first time doing this and we're learning about procedures just as you are. Also, I want to ask our colleagues to be mindful of how much space we are taking up. Meaning, have you talked more than once? Have you perhaps interrupted another colleague or um, basically repeated what another colleague just said? So please be mindful of the space you're taking up and balance that too with your positions of power. Um, let's all be willing, if possible, to sit with discomfort. Some of us might say something that others don't like or we might feel misunderstood. Um, so please be willing to sit with that in the service of transformational change but also be willing to call us out if we need to improve in something. Um, and also we encourage that this discussion be solutions focused um, and, and not just stick with this is what's wrong without providing perhaps some suggestions, although that is welcome. Um, I would like to now open briefly the space in the chat, couple seconds, anything else that we should add to our suggested agreements, feel free to type it in the chat. Um, and while we do that, um, I will be monitoring the chat and mentioning, um, but with that in mind um, and due to time, I'm gonna turn it over to Tina to start discussing our ticketed sessions. Thank you, Tina. 
Awesome. Yeah, thanks. So I'm happy to be here to discuss a little bit more about the process for our ticketed sessions. And so you can think about ticketed events as really a way that is designed to offer membership kind of focused educational opportunities at many different levels. So some of these are pitched at a more basic level, right? And others are pitched at a more a level that requires some kind of expertise to attend. Most of our ticketed events, I will say one exception, require an additional payment um, and they all provide CEs. Uh, one thing to note is that ticketed events are due in submission at least kind of a month before our general session. So there is a different structure, a different portal, and a different review process, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, note for this year, all ticketed events must be submitted by Tuesday, February 8th, uh, 3 a.m. Eastern. Never really understood why it's 3 a.m., but <laughs> uh, that is the case. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we have seven different types of ticketed events, uh, some that are more clinically focused and others that are more kind of research or method focused. And I'm just gonna go over these briefly. And so our first uh, ticket event is our institutes. And these are traditionally held pre-conference. Um, so when we were in person, they were all on Thursdays. Uh, with the pandemic, you've noticed that some of these have been on Tuesday and, and Wednesday just to make our electronic uh, uh, portal work, right? You can think about these as really some kind of flagship presentations for the conference. And so they're either submitted as a half day, so five hour presentation, or a full day, seven hour session. And we limit the amount of attendance at these to 40 members or 40 participants rather, because it allows kind of for more focused interaction and discussion. Uh, generally to present an institute, you have to have presented this work previously at ABCT or another kind of similar uh, convention and audience. Uh, the next is uh, the traditional workshops. Right, and so you can think about these as an anchor to our convention and they occur during the convention proper. So uh, usually on Fridays and Saturdays of the convention. They're three hours long and they're aimed at covering concerns from the practitioner, the educator, or the researcher, right? Uh, these vary in topic, but we try to balance the program as much as possible. And so a lot of times we have uh, uh, things like working with sexual and gender minorities, or maybe a, a presentation focused on kind of behavioral activation in older adults. Um, these are things that we think our membership will be interested in and also kind of round out our programming. Our minis, our mini workshops are a personal favorite of mine. They were added more recently in response to member feedback. And these are pitched at a more basic level. So they address direct clinical care. Uh, they're 90 minutes and they're held throughout the condition. One thing to note that while we do ask that people submit for minis in the ticketed events, these are free to membership because we think it's a really great opportunity to learn something new or about a different area that you don't have as much of experience in. Um, and again, uh, these are kind of uh, really, really well attended. We try not to limit attendance in these like we do with the other things. It's really limited generally by room size and things like that. We also have our MCSs, which are our master clinician seminars. And this is where kind of the most skilled clinicians or experts in our field present their methods, uh, how they treat patients. And importantly, we ask people to have kind of video or audio or other demonstrations of their clinical work. Uh, these are two hours and they're offered throughout the convention. Again, we limit attendance. Um, and kind of like, unlike the other things, we also ask that there are only two presenters. So the institutes, traditional workshops, mini workshops, generally you can have up to four presenters. MCSs, we limited to two. Next slide, please. We also have ticketed sessions that aren't necessarily focused predominantly on clinical work, although they often have a clinical application. So we have our RPD series, or our research and professional development really focused on the kind of how to or uh, the, the kind of theories and about how to develop your own career, conduct research. 
Uh, so these have been uh, things like how to do research in clinical practice, for example, or in private practice rather, or kind of the types of uh, careers that one can do from management to uh, being a professor, uh, kind of uh, working at an academic medical center versus uh, at an R1 or something like that. We allow submitters to specify both the type of the length of the presentation, anywhere from one hour to two hours, and the format. So some of these are panels, uh, if it makes sense. Others are uh, kind of more participatory, kind of hands-on experiences. We also have our AMAS series, uh, uh, which focuses on advanced methodology and statistics. So the topics vary each year. And really these are designed to enhance kind of research abilities in a four hour long session. Typically these were also offered pre-convention or so on the Thursday before the conference. Um, one of the things that's pretty common in AMAS is for people to have their computers and to actually be practicing uh, the applications as the presenter is going. So very, very applied here. The other type of ticketed session I want to mention, even though that people don't submit for this, rather these are invited talks or our CITs or our clinical in intervention training. And these are kind of one or two day events really emphasizing the how to of clinical interventions. And really with the extended link that allows for kind of more interaction and more in depth discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is not for someone to, for people to have to kind of memorize or write down or things like that. But one of the efforts we really are trying to do is make it easier to decide what type of ticketed event to submit. Because we realize that this has been confusing for membership. We get a lot of questions about it. And so for us as a committee, we really came up with a flow chart to help us think about kind of what belongs where. And one of the things that you'll note that's different this year is that once you sign in to submit any type of ticket event, you'll have basically a drop down list of yes, no questions to guide you to what is the most likely type of presentation to fit what you're hoping to present, if that makes sense. Um, and so you'll have this guide that we have laid out here in a format within the submission portal. Uh, one thing to note is that even when people submit an event, we look at balancing the program. And so sometimes someone might be asked uh, to move to a different type of uh, ticketed event. So for example, someone submits a, a five hour institute and we look at the program and say, this might be fitting better in a workshop. We will always ask, right? And to see if you're uh, willing and able to do such a thing. Um, but sometimes we do move things around as a committee. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we review these things, right? So all submissions are reviewed by the relevant committee. So if you said, uh, submit an institute, it's reviewed by the institute committee. And also, as I mentioned, kind of by the convention committee as a whole, right? So that is kind of all of our ticketed events. We look at, again, kind of what is the nature of these offerings and how does that fit with uh, ABC ties priorities, our convention theme, um, and kind of draw. So our overall considerations always first and foremost is scientific merit. But also, as I alluded to, draw is important, particularly for those things that occur on Thursday or pre-convention. So when we're in person, and I hope we are next year, uh, you know, uh, draw is important because uh, these things like institutes require people to fly in a day early, right? So we want it to be broadly applicable and for people to want to attend. And so we do look at that. As I mentioned, program balance, what does that mean? Well, we're looking at our prior priority areas, but also wanting to make sure that things like a lifespan are covered. So we want to make sure that we have both child and adult offerings, that we have offerings in terms of older adults, that we have offerings in uh, that balance in terms of population studied or treatment modality. So all of those things are, are taken into consideration. And certainly we always look at feedback from prior conventions, right? So if you, if you submitted something previously, if it's been well received uh, in, in one format, we might ask you or, or uh, might be looking at uh, how to continue that uh, in a different format. 
there are a few specific considerations, right? So to present an institute, you have to have presented similar material previously at ABCT or another national or international convention, right? And of course, if you're presenting an intervention, that intervention has to have strong empirical support. So institutes are not something where uh, people pre present kind of treatment development work. We ask that you submit that to the more kind of general sessions, maybe a symposium or something like that. And so there should have been a published RCT um, in any intervention that is in an institute. Same thing with traditional workshops, you gotta have empirical support. Um, and the other thing, uh, the other type of submission that requires something is a master clinician. You have to be kind of a recognized expert in the field. Uh, so to be a master clinician or to present an MCS, uh, this is typically not more junior people. These are people who are more well-established, tend to be more uh, senior people. And uh, I think now we're gonna move over to talk about general. Sure. Tina, thank you so much. In the spirit of the topic, Rebecca asks, if we presented at a past convention, for example, mini workshop, are we able to get the feedback to guide future submissions? So we, I mean, that is, I think that is something that we can discuss uh, uh, more broadly. Traditionally, we have not made that feedback kind of uh, widely available to my knowledge. Stephen certainly used to pipe in and correct me if I'm I'm wrong or mistaken on that. Um, and I wonder we do Tina, ask people if it's, to if it's feedback those. from participants, sorry, because they presented at a past convention, mini workshop. So I think it's feedback to guide future submissions from participants. Uh, well, so for things uh, like workshops or institutes, we do ask you to collect and summarize evaluations. Right, so you would have kind of those summaries that you also submit to central office that we look at. Gotcha. So Rebecca, I don't know. Yes, feedback is given to presenters. Um, and I think that we'll note that it'll be important to let presenters know how to access that participant feedback. Excellent. And then Jeffrey Cohen asks if for cultural issues or adaptations of interventions, would an RCT be required or would some empirical um, support suffice? Some empirical support would su suffice. Awesome. Thanks, Tina. And I think we have, awesome. Keep them coming. We're going to continue, but that's exactly what we want. Be able to answer questions as they come up. Yeah. All right, great. So now we've talked about ticketed sessions, with which if you've noticed in the forums and email blasts, that is due sooner than what are called general sessions. So general sessions are your symposia, panels, clinical roundtables, spotlight research, et cetera, which we'll discuss a little bit more in detail in a bit. Um, just FYI, this was important to me as program chair. I, I wasn't aware of this, so I'm learning as I go along. An individual must limit to six, the number of general submissions um, we submit as speakers. I don't think that'll be an issue for most people, but just so you know, and a speaker is considered any of these roles, chair, moderator, presenter, panelist, or discussant, just FYI. And if you submit six, your acceptance is limited to four. So again, doesn't apply to a lot of people, but I just wanted to let y'all know. Also, general sessions are free or included, I should say, with your registration. There's no extra cost to attend these. And traditionally, we have over 220 offerings. And the portal opens soon, February 7th. Really important. A lot of your questions can actually be answered by logging into the portal and starting a new submission. And you'll be getting a lot of instructions. And you can always return to your submission. So if you feel a little hesitant to open an account or start one, please don't, because you can return to it. And if you decide not to submit anything, nothing happens. Another important thing to know, the deadline is technically Tuesday, March 7th, but I say technically because it's at 12 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard, 2 a.m. Central, 3 a.m. Eastern. So technically it's March 8th. March 8th. But if you're listening to me, don't, don't think March 8th, think March 7th. That's really important. You'll get access to these slides. So I included a link to the call for abstracts. Um, let's move to the next slide. All right, so breaking it down, what are symposia? So where I want you to think about a good symposia submission is 
uh, paper that's been published or data that's been collected. These are presentations of research based on data, which could be quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods. And reviewers will be instructed to give equal importance to, to any types of these um, analyses. These are usually 60 to 90 minutes in length, and they could have one or two chairs, one discussant, and between three or five papers. However, the total number of speakers may not exceed six. This is really important. Based on previous membership feedback, there was a move to include not just early career presenters or students, but a mix of senior presenters and early career presenters. But this is something we would welcome feedback on today. Um, clinical roundtables are more discussions or debates informed by individuals on current important topics. And here's the difference, more based to patient care, treatment, um, and the applications to what we do with clients day to day. And this includes a moderator and between three to six panelists with a range of experiences and attitudes. Um, and so if you have an idea where you want to really engage in discussion between clinicians, researchers, but the whole goal is how does this affect our, the CBT clinicians daily practice, that's a clinical roundtable. And the total number of speakers may not exceed seven. And you may be wondering, where do I find this? This is all on the ABCT website under convention, but you'll also get a link um, to these slides at the end. We also have panel discussions, and these are more um, debates, discussions informed by individuals on a current topic of conceptual nature rather than pertaining necessarily to clinical care. So this is kind of the clinical roundtable's cousin. Um, one is focused more on clinical care and panels are more based on theory, concepts, movements in the field. They could be based on data, but don't necessarily have to present a paper. And this is organized by a moderator and can include three to five panelists with a range of experiences and um, views and attitudes. Um, and the total number of speakers here may not exceed seven. So Laura asks, can you discuss the implications of including seniority in the decision-making process on diversity of accepted presenters? Laura, that is an excellent point and something that we really want feedback on. We notice that um, that does limit the, the diversity of our speakers. It does limit some topics where the expertise may be more on younger faculty or graduate students. So um, we're going to discuss at the end some potential ideas to perhaps make the review process more objective and less subjective. Um, which we'll talk about at the end, I promise. So I'll return to your question. Um, spotlight research presentations. This is a very cool format for groundbreaking, innovative research hot off the press that has the potential to change how we practice or how we, you know, do science. And for that, this would be allotted a 45 minute slot. So way longer than a symposia and 15 minute Q&A. So um, we really welcome um, any groundbreaking research in a spotlight research presentation format. And I wanna make it very clear, this year we will not be focusing on, on names. The, the data and the research will speak for itself. And this could be from an early career student, grad student, faculty, as long as the science is groundbreaking, we wanna spotlight it. And then poster sessions, um, we are all familiar with those, but this is more one-on-one -on -one discussions between researchers who use graphic representations to show what they've been up to. And we usually have about one, like 1,200 to 1,400 poster presenters each year. Um, all right. So I'll get to the questions real quick. Um, let me round off with this. And then we have targeted and specific programming. So this really refers to a couple of things um, that you might be used to at the ABCT convention, some of which are not necessarily submissions. So invited addresses or panels, typically we have around three. Um, this year we're hoping four keynotes and one or two invited panels that are chosen by the program convention 
um, chair and co-chair and president. Um, and the goal of this is to bring, um, you know, very uh, groundbreaking work being done by um, scientists locally or internationally to share with membership. And it's usually very focused in the convention theme. Ticketed sessions, which we've already discussed, what we're deeming special sessions, which you've seen the postdoctoral and internship um, clinical roundtables and, and sessions and discussions. This is very much focused on career development, how to submit a grant, meet NIH um, program grant officers, et cetera. And of course, our SIG meetings, which each year we have more special interest groups that meet and do amazing work. So I'm gonna stop here and give some um, time for a few questions that came in. If we're a reviewer, how are we supposed to know information about whether a person is senior or not? Excellent, excellent question. So um, traditionally, um, reviewers have, have not been blind to who submits. And really, there hasn't been a format to really quantify seniority or expertise. So we'll talk about in the light, later portion of this um, meeting in a little bit, some suggestions we have to help reviewers and some potential suggestions to make this less biased. So I'll get to that. Um, and then I have presented at ABCT annually since 2013, showing that women are underrepresented in the more prestigious conference roles. This is from Laura Sokol. This data is based on the program guide and only reflects accepted presentations. Have you been able to look at submission versus acceptance by demographics now that this information was collected at the point of submission? So Laura, we have not looked at that. Um, I am going to ask my uh, Emily and Susan to make note of this so that we can ask um, Stephen for this data and we can analyze it. And hopefully I can maybe circle back with you for some recommendations as this is really important. And Rebecca says, in the past years, I have been part of a submission for a clinical roundtable with six sponsorship that has not been accepted. Um, very good point. And she points has happened multiple times when I submit as a clinical roundtable that is research versus clinical heavy. So Rebecca, that is an excellent point. And that is something that um, I would like Emily to make a note of so we can bring back to discussion in a second. So my final part of the presentation, and then we'll turn it over to Emily and discussion. I thought it was important um, as program chair to discuss a little bit the convention theme and what it is and what it is not. And also please note that although we're very, very hopeful that this will happen in person in New York City, um, this is all pending our friend COVID. And we will base our decision to go in person hybrid or fully virtual based on um, the data. So please keep that in mind. So our theme is very appropriate with the times we're living in. It's emergency and disaster preparedness and response, using cognitive behavioral science to make an impact. And we, we kind of came to this theme because even though we know that COVID is not our only emergency, it's a great example of how a lot of the public health decisions have not been made by scientists or guided by science. And we came to the idea of where are we in developing a robust theory in sound science to be able to respond to not just COVID, but all the public and mental health emergencies and syndemics that we're facing today. So this is not a COVID-19 focused convention. It is um, certainly a part of it, but we really want submissions focused on, we have all these mental health, public health emergencies listed here and more. So what are we doing? What is the latest evidence? And not only what is the groundbreaking theory, but what are we doing in terms of decreasing mental health disparities in this policy, dissemination, implementation work, and very important to us, training the next generation to be the leading scientists and clinicians in addressing um, the 21st century's greatest challenges when it comes to mental health and public health. So currently, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily of how has been the current review process for general sessions, and then we'll get to the questions on the chat. So Emily, take it away. 
I might need to unmute Emily one second. There we go. Thanks, Rosara. Um, so currently we're working on revising some of the criteria and had a great deal of help from last year's program chair and associate program chair who really tried to make these more consistent with the NIH criteria. And so the abstracts will be reviewed based on several things, including scientific merit, which Tina talked about a bit earlier, quality, clarity, relevance to ABCT's priorities, uh, relevance to the convention theme specifically, which Rosara just reviewed with you, and potential contribution to the field. So some of the things as a reviewer that you might see would be things like significance. So the impact of the study on the field of cognitive behavioral science or scientific knowledge in clinical practice. Uh, other things like approach. So strategy, methodology, uh, quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods, statistical analyses, um, or words like innovation. So does this study have the potential to shift research or clinical practice paradigms? Does it use novel theoretical models, approaches, or procedures? Um, and very importantly, um, there's a, an item assessing, does this submission include diverse populations, including traditionally underrepresented groups, individuals across the lifespan, or does it present research with clearly stated significant implications for diverse populations? Uh, and this is something that we feel is, is really important to be represented in the criteria this year. Um, in addition, the appropriateness to the theme. So like Rosara said, this is not a COVID-19 conference. Um, there are many, many syndemics um, occurring that we need to attend to, uh, but a focus on um, how we can use cognitive behavioral science to attend to and prepare for some of the disasters that we're seeing globally. Okay. Um, and these submissions will be reviewed and scored independently by three program committee members. And these are individuals who've been selected from nominations by SIGs and self-nominations, which are then evaluated and approved by the program chair, Rosara. Next slide, please. Okay, so what happens after you submit your uh, proposal? So reviewers currently have not been blind to authorship, but are instructed to recuse themselves in the case of real or apparent conflicts of interest. Um, as we've alluded to, this is something that we're thinking about changing um, to be more congruent with peer review. Um, also importantly, given that we have a large number of high quality submissions across submission types, acceptance decisions can be really difficult. We've got lots of highly rated, awesome science going on, and that's ultimately a good problem. Um, but we currently don't provide feedback on submissions or reconsider rejected submissions. Um, and these decisions um, in the past haven't always been based on reviewer ratings alone because the ratings have been so close together um, and many are rated very highly. Um, and so importantly, um, the program chair and the committee have considered the full portfolio of the program. So for example, I'm sure we'll receive many submissions about research around COVID-19. As we said, we want to focus also on the opioid epidemic or mass violence, these sorts of things. And so we want to make sure that we have representation across a wide swath and not just um, representation in one particular topic area. So even though this year has been dominated by COVID-19 in, in many ways, but also in research, there are many other things that we want to see represented. And so ratings are going to be our objective criterion and will hold the most weight, but we also want to prioritize a balance across topic areas. Next slide, please. Okay, so I believe that concludes the uh, slide portion of our presentation. So I'll turn it back over to you, Rosar. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know that was a lot in the last 20 minutes. Um, now is the important part. We wanna open it for membership feedback. We have quite a bit of comments on the chat, um, but I'm going to um, go ahead and stop sharing for a second because I want us to be able to engage. Um, for folks who want to turn on their cameras, that's great. If not, no worries. So um, if you could use your raise hand button if you would like to be unmuted. And while folks do that, I'm going to start reading some of the questions forwarded to me. Um, Jill, I don't know, would you like to state your question or do you want me to read it? If you, if you would like me to unmute, you just raise your hand. Okay. All right, cool. I'll just read it real quick. So. Um, Oh, you do want to unmute? Okay, here we go. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> it says, um, I found it confusing that the symposia description was rooted in treatment research per se. 
I feel like over the years, psychopathology research relevant to theory has also been welcome. So maybe I misunderstood the description or is this a change? So Jill, this one I can answer. You are correct. And that means to me that we need to revise our language on the website. So that is something that we will make sure um, we directly took it from the website and we will be changing because it shouldn't be treatment research only. It should be all types of theory-based research. Thank you, Jill. Susan, if you can make a note of that, I would greatly appreciate it. I wanna to return to the SIG sponsorship question and then go to Taryn, who is my next person and Allison, who's my next person. So again, this is where I invite um, suggested agreement grace. I am new to this, right? And so really what I'm hearing over and over from folks is, hey, this was sponsored by our SIG and yet it was not accepted. So what's the point? And multiple members coming with that. So I kind of want um, to share my perspective on that. And then I'd like to give the um, microphone to Taryn because she's agreeing that this is important to her. Um, so really this year, what we're hoping to do is um, based our criteria on just scores. Traditionally, there was a yes, no, maybe, except, which was weighted heavily, and then scores. We want to focus it on scores. And so we want membership from feedback. What should we do if SIG sponsors, but reviewers rate it low? Because that's a possibility. What should we do if SIGs don't sponsor and this is rated mega high from reviewers, right? So I'm just gonna pose that out there to membership and Taryn, I'm gonna unmute you real quick. Give me one second. Because these are all possibilities that might happen. You have the floor, Taryn. Yeah, I got my hand up so you can still find me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you addressing the SIG sponsorship issue. I'm a member of several SIGs, and I, I want to kind of talk about that in the context of some of the things Laura has been bringing up. Um, you know, certainly Laura's research shows a, a, a large trend of uh, women being much more likely to be poster presenters than presenters on panels or symposia, and certainly not chairs, right? Um, and then we, I don't think we've even like scratched the surface of looking at race, ethnicity, right? First generation college, right? Very important voices that I think um, when we are emphasizing things like seniority can get washed out. And I think that some of that goes into the SIGs as well, right? Which things are selected there, um, you know, which things are represented versus not typically in the program. I was really happy last year to see a lot of things talking about diversity, but I also know it was the convention theme. So like what's gonna happen in future years? Um, this is something that the SIG leaders have really been talking a lot about in our meetings. And so I just wanna see where the program committee is uh, on or the chairs here on um, thinking about these. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's super helpful. Um... Laura, Emily, Tina, thoughts um, on what Taryn just mentioned? Are there any further comments from the program? Um, I might need to unmute folks. Thanks, Rosara. I can chime in on that uh, briefly. And I think um, what you're expressing is, is most certainly evident in um, the uh, program uh, descriptions that you'll see and the the list of abstracts and things like that. I also think, you know, Laura, your point about um, what's actually accepted versus what's just submitted is well taken and something that we can certainly consider. I think one important thing um, that Rosara emphasized in the slides with seniority is that part of the reason that the suggestion of a mix of early career and senior people was put in is to avoid having just senior people presenting their expert research and things like that. And so I do think um, that is that is one step is ensuring that it's not just senior folks. I think as Rosara and I think about this, and, and if you think of this year as the only one in which we truly have behavioral control over what happens and we hope to influence future years, but of course can't speak to that at this time. Um, something that we wanna focus on is representation and allowing the maximum number of people to present and not um, just focusing on, let's hear from the experts on a wide swath of topics. I don't know, Laura, Rosara, Tina, if you wanna chime in as well, I can stop. I mean, sorry, I was muted before and I couldn't unmute myself. 
You know, I, I think, uh, you know, consistent with a uh, kind of evolution in ABC priorities, the focus on diversity, equity, inclusion will certainly continue and be a major focus of, of the organization and the conference going forward. So I can certainly speak to that uh, in terms of uh, the ticketed events. I think one of the things that we were, uh, were thinking about last year or the year before, uh, most happy to see was an increase in the uh, diversity, broadly speaking, of what uh, was submitted and our ability to uh, move the conference in, 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 in different ways. And so um, just to answer that, that is a hundred percent continues to be a priority, not just for the convention committee, but I know for, for ABCT as a whole, as they're looking at their kind of strategic plan. Yeah. Thanks, Tina and Emily. And to add to that, Taryn, one thing that occurs to me, and Emily, let's discuss this, is how can we provide a weight on ratings that provides an extra weight for six sponsorship? Does that make sense? So it's an extra point or it's an extra oomph to make sure that it's included um, uh, quantitatively. And also, um, just so you note, um, Remily, Laura, and I will be posting the general session review criteria online on the website this year so that submitters know, just as for NIH, SAMHSA panels, what are the criteria, okay? Um, I want to turn it over to our next person on the queue, Allison, then we'll go with um, Juventino, followed by Laura, and then a comment by Sarah. So Allison, let me find you real quick. And um, what is your last name? Okay, ask to unmute. Go ahead, Allison. Hi, thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate all the flexibility and looking at the definitions of how things are scored and rated. One of the concerns that I have is while on one hand, of course, RCTs are the gold standard in research, in higher acuity settings, and I work in an inpatient setting, RCTs are not the standard of, of research or really even feasible. So as we're moving towards an implementation science framework, moving towards evidence-based practice in a range of settings, you know, how can research be looked at from that lens, right? Where we're doing quality improvement prod projects, um, looking at routine outcome data and things, you know, that are not amenable to RCTs. And I think that dovetails to kind of looking at even the clinical roundtables needing demonstrated effectiveness and efficacy where these are enormous steps in residential programs, inpatient programs, and yet we're not going to be able to meet that kind of research criteria. Um, numerous times I've presented and submitted things um, that are strong panels in these settings and they haven't been accepted, or when they were accepted, they seem to be in really undesirable places and un un um, like in days and times that aren't even well attended. So it definitely punishes my submission behavior, leading me to submit elsewhere where those things are more received. So I'd love, I'd love to um, hear your, your thoughts on that. Thanks, Allison. So making sure I fully um, understand it, it's that we, we're not in the same level in different fields and topics as the RCT or might not be right. appropriate. So your submissions, program eval, which is a lot of what I do, gets punished. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. And ABCT looks heavily outpatient focused, um, which is the vast majority of providers, sure. And yet we want to move in evidence-based practice in inpatient hospitals where we're treating severe mental illness. And um, ABCT is a you know important platform for that work. Excellent. So I want to make a clarification um, on something you said, which is the first thing I'll address. So for ticketed sessions, for master clinician workshops, for what happens pre-conference um, is, is a little bit different than general right now, right? So that's where the RCT must be proven, got mentioned. So I wanted to double check with you, Allison, are you referring to that ticketed session or general sessions? Broad concerns for, for both. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to um, see Emily, Tina, um, Laura, any thoughts on that? No? Do I need to unmute anyone? So I'm going to, I'm going to say the following, Allison. I'm not going to pretend I have a ready answer for that. I'm going to note it as a, a significant concern. I think that Emily and I need to address review criteria that speaks to this and the importance stated for the reviewer of program eval, of the setting, 
Um, and also I'm hearing that we might need to bring this back to ticketed and have a discussion with them. So I appreciate so that, much. Allison. I, I really, really appreciate it um, and appreciate this town hall. So thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Laura, I'm gonna unmute you now. Um, and try, let's try to keep it brief, um, Laura. So, so two minutes, go ahead. I think you just jumped someone in the queue ahead of me. I'm so sorry, who, who did I jump? Valentino, did I jump you? Yep, okay, sorry. Thank you, Laura. Hey, Juve. <laughs> Juve was my postdoc. I'm so sorry to do that to you. <laughs> Here we go. No worries, all good. Um, uh, so thank you all for having uh, this forum to discuss conference submissions. Um, so similar to what others have said, I'm right now um, the chair for the Latinx Special Interest Group. Um, there's been, um, I guess year after year, some concerns from uh, our SIG uh, membership that feel that uh, per, uh, submissions are not accepted. Um, and I think part of the issue is not receiving that feedback. Um, so kind of thinking of recommendations is thinking about um, providing some feedback. I know that that could be a lot and thinking about how many submissions ABCT receives. And so maybe it's particularly for the special interest group sponsored submissions. Um, so they know uh, areas of improvement or places where um, uh, why their submission wasn't accepted. Um, similarly, I think in one of those slides, it was mentioned that program decisions aren't based solely on the reviews. So if they're based off of programmatic decisions, um, for example, the theme of the conference, it might be helpful to have a written statement about some of those decisions, um, broadly speaking, for the general membership to know why certain submissions were accepted over others, um, the breakdown of the submission acceptances and how they fit with the theme or the values that um, ABCT has for their conference. Um, so that's just one kind of general recommendation. The second one is focused also on reviewers and providing um, maybe more training for reviewers. Um, I've been a reviewer now for a few years, and I know that sometimes it's a bit difficult to know, you know, what's a three versus what's a four. Um, and so being able to provide maybe a recorded Zoom session. So for those who can't go, they can view it and something brief because we're, of course, you know, we're all busy and everything. Um, but something that could provide reviewers with some additional training and support on how to interpret the criteria, um, maybe an FAQ for um, certain kind of uh, submissions where maybe we're not a content expert in it, or maybe it's a novel research methodology and we don't really know what to do with that or how to rate it. Some guidance from uh, the convention team on what to do with those, because I, I, I kind of suspect that that is something that is occurring with others too, um, where we receive a ton of submissions, but we're not really sure how to evaluate them and what is the distinction between like a three and a four or two and a three and so forth. Excellent, Juve. I'm gonna pass it to Emily that has some follow-up to this. And um, Susan, can you please take note of Juve's suggestions? Because um, Juve, that's one thing that we're gonna do this year, um, a YouTube tutorial for reviewers. Um, but I like your idea of a fact sheet. And also, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't understand why we get comments from manuscripts and we don't get them for conventions. I understand it's a lot of work, but how can we improve and how can um, folks know what happened? But I also understand it's more than 1,500 submissions. So how can we come to a better feedback way is important, um, is what I'm hearing. Um, Emily, could you please uh, say what you were going to say and mention our blinding idea? Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for the, these suggestions. And I really appreciate um, this perspective. I think uh, I agree with you, Rosara, that it, it is hard to not receive feedback on a submission that was rejected. Uh, I want to address also part of what you said. I think um, the training piece is really important. So as we prepare the criteria, we're also preparing a guide for how to review with a step-by-step -step screenshotted guide. So you can see exactly where you should be clicking, but also a YouTube tutorial that will film using Zoom and then provide 
um, so that we can show you exactly where to click. And some of that will be more um, pragmatic, right? Where do you click to do what? But also some of it will be content focused of what is the difference between a four and a three? And what is this? what does this criteria specifically mean? Um, Importantly, Rosara and I have also been speaking a lot with Laura about the possibility of blinding all submissions. Um, can, we, can we call it masking? Sorry, um, someone pointed that blinding might is inappropriate language. So um, masking absolutely. or anonymizing, sorry about that. Yep, my apologies. So masking, so this would be, you do not know who submit what. And so this should, first of all, reduce conflicts of interest, uh, but also really focuses you on the content of the session. Now you might be thinking, well, how do I then know that this person is an expert? Um, we'll be adding a question um, to for this person to delineate what it is that makes them an expert. I've presented this before. I've done a workshop at ABCT, those sorts of things. Um, and so this is something that we're thinking about and we'd really appreciate feedback on if there are areas where you feel as a reviewer, I need to know who this person is to evaluate whether or not they're an appropriate presenter, send that over. We'd love to hear that. Our strongest feeling is about symposia. Uh, we feel that those should be masked um, so that you cannot see who um, the individuals are that you're reviewing. I also want to go back to one thing, Allison, with your question. I wanted to check with Tina before I chimed in, but just wanted to clarify that the evidence that needs to exist for an intervention does not have to be from you or your group. So for example, if you're applying CBT in an inpatient setting, the evidence is there for CBT, doesn't have to be done by you, can be RCTs done many, many years ago, um, but you may be applying it in a program evaluation context or QI context, those sorts of things. Uh, but I just wanted to check with Tina since um, this may apply to ticketed as well before I responded. So apologies for my delay. I would really like thoughts um, in the chat, masking, yay, nay. Like if you have a thought, could you just put in the chat, yay, nay, or yay for this, no for that, we will be downloading this chat. Um, so please, everyone who can, please write in. Um, Laura, um, we have two minutes. Um, I want to make sure I show a slide. Um, so I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to um, ask you to, include it in the chat um because i am so uh i unfortunately did not do a good time monitoring this um we are almost done with time i wish we would have done 90 minutes um please take out your cell phones um you can scan the powerpoint slides and have access to it you can scan the submission portal and have access to the information what are our next steps because there wasn't enough time Please email convention at abct.org um, to submit more feedback, thoughts, anything that you want us to consider live for 2022. Um, we will come up with an actionable step guide for 2022. Just so you know, depending on the yay nays, that might include masking of presentations, that might include an extra weight um, scored by SIG sponsorship, reviewing review criteria, doing a reviewer's guide and video with an FAQ and um, other uh, changes for 2022. And that which we feel needs more time for implementation, we will discuss with the 2023 programming committee. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, and I'll stay a minute behind for any other um, comments, but for those who need to go, I hope you have a great day. <laughs>